p.m. Eastern Time, you have joined the webinar to assist law enforcement agency applications for the Bureau of Justice Assistance, FY 2015 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. To allow for late arrivals, we will be starting this event in a few minutes. At Justice Center. Thank you for joining the webinar to assist law enforcement agencies' applications for the Bureau of Justice Assistance FY 2015 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. This webinar has been sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and it is geared towards law enforcement agencies that are interested in applying for the FY 2015 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Grant. For today's webinar, we will have presentations from five speakers, Cynthia Kimmelman DeVries is the Deputy Director of the Behavior Health Program at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Danica Binkley is a Senior Policy Advisor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Jerry Murphy is the Director of the Law Enforcement Program at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. We also have with us two representatives from the FY 2013 JMHCP cohort. Eileen Flory is a CIT coordinator with the Bend Police Department in Oregon, and Jenna Savage is a senior research coordinator with the Boston Police Department. After a brief presentation by our speakers, there will be time for a question and answer. To ask a question, please type the question into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions. If your questions do not get answered during the webinar, please follow up via email after the event has ended. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx technical support at 1-866-229-3239. We understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording this event and will be emailing the recording to all of the attendees as well as posting it on our website later this week. At this time, I would now like to turn over the presentation to Ms. Cynthia Kimmelman de Vries. Hi everyone, my name is Cynthia Kimmelman DeVries and I'm a Deputy Director in our Behavioral Health Project here at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I represent the team of technical assistance coordinators assigned to each jurisdiction awarded a Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, or JMHCP for short, grant. Um, I'd like to give you a very short description of who the Council of State Governments Justice Center is, what we do, and then talk briefly about the general JMHCP grant program. The Council of State Government, CSG, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership association that investigates a host of different issues, from transportation, education, healthcare, and the environment, to criminal justice, which is handled by our division called the Justice Center. The Justice Center has a number of different project areas that we work on, including our behavioral health project, which seeks to improve criminal justice and mental health responses to people with mental disorders that are engaged with the criminal justice system. This is where the technical assistance we provide JMHCP grantees is housed. We also operate the National Reentry Resource Center, which serves as a primary source of information and guidance in the reentry field, seeks to advance the use of evidence-based practices and policies, and create a network of practitioners, researchers, and policymakers invested in reducing recidivism. Under our reentry work, we also provide technical assistance to the Second Chance Ask Grant Program, another BJA-funded initiative. We have been the sole technical assistance provider for both grant programs since their inception, JMHCP in 2006 and Second Chance Act in 2009. Between both programs and to date, we have worked with over 900 different jurisdictions and grant-funded programs. To learn more about what we do and the services we provide, you'll see later on in the resources section, please visit our website, csgjusticecenter.org. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the general JMHCP solicitation and grant program. The JMHCP grant program supports innovative cross-system collaboration for individuals with mental illnesses or co-occurring mental health and substance abuse disorders who come into contact with the justice system. A major goal of JMHCP is to facilitate collaboration among the criminal justice, mental health, and substance abuse treatment systems to increase access to mental health and other treatment services for individuals with mental disorders or co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. JMHCP is authorized by the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Crime Reduction Act, or MIOCRA, in 2004 and was reauthorized once again in 2008. JMH, JMHCP funds a very wide set of programs. Today we'll be focusing specifically on the types of law enforcement responses that have and could be funded, but we thought it might be helpful to hear a little bit about the diversity in programs to give you a sense of just how creative jurisdictions can be. Not only does this program provide services for system-involved individuals with mental illnesses, but programs have also been funded to provide specialized training programs for criminal justice and mental health personnel. Grantees have used their funds to create entire training academies or roll out crisis intervention training to whole precincts and counties. Additionally, programs have been funded to plan and expand mental health courts, alternative prosecution and sentencing programs, pretrial services, and other court-based initiatives. They have also been funded to provide traditional reentry or transitional services for people returning back into the community from correctional institutions. We will not go over this today, but pages five through nine of the solicitation outline all of the allowable uses and guidelines jurisdictions need to follow when proposing a new initiative. There are three categories or types of grants funded under JMHCP. Category one, which we will not be reviewing today, focuses on reducing the prevalence of individuals with mental disorders in jails. Category two, which you see on your screen, or planning and implementation grants, are a three-year $250,000 grant, and category three are expansion grants, which are a two-year $200,000 grant. P&I grants specifically spend approximately six months to one year planning and setting up policies and procedures for their initiatives and the remaining time implementing them. These are usually new or first-time projects. Expansion grants are usually jurisdictions that have an operational program and would like to layer on new services or extend their target population. A drug court, for example, that would like to start seeing and delivering services to the mental health clients that come to their doors, or a probation department that wants to create a specialized mental health caseload and supervisory system. Today, Jerry Murphy, um, Nikki and team are going to discuss what P&I and expansion grants look like on the ground when implementing or expanding specialized law enforcement initiatives. Later next week, we'll be conducting a follow-up webinar where we will review the general requirements for the solicitation, answer questions about the allowable uses, types of partnerships and agencies that can apply, and other questions that jurisdictions might have. Today, however, we'd like to contain the discussion and Q&A to just the priority consideration outlined in the Initiative for Law Enforcement Strategies. Thank you, Cynthia. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Danica Binkley. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Danica Binkley. I'm a Senior Policy Advisor for Justice and Health at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which includes um, general oversight of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. Um, some of you may have seen um, my name um, from the different outreach I did for this webinar and have reached out to me and I'm very happy um, that so many of you have made it onto the webinar today. So I just wanted to start kitten and kick things off by stating that um, obviously this is a major priority for uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Department of Justice in terms of really trying to connect law enforcement with the necessary resources um, that they need in order to craft appropriate responses to dealing with individuals with mental illness. Um, as you will read through the solicitation, as you take the time to go through it, you will see that we did carefully um, provide a lot of justification as to why law enforcement is such a priority consideration, um, but obviously us holding this webinar, hosting it for all of you, is also proof that we really want to encourage you um, to apply for these funds and really want to encourage and support these types of collaborations. So 
in the solicitation, we do lay out um, some very specific uh, criteria for the law enforcement uh, receipt of priority consideration, which really focuses on implementing or expanding um, specialized law enforcement strategies tailored to meet the pe needs of people with mental disorders. Um, and that can be looking at a range of options here. I know a lot of folks think when they think me mental health and law enforcement, they automatically go to CIT. And while crisis intervention teams are very important um, to looking at the overall scope of solutions and programs for law enforcement, they're not the only solution. Um, so that's partly why we wanted to hold this webinar today to, to give you a flavor of some other types of solutions that are out there, different types of collaborations. Um, but just as a, a summary um, of a very short list, which is not ex exclusive at all, um, that can include developing specialized receiving or diversion centers, um, computerized information systems, law enforcement mental health programs, and conducting local evaluation. So those are all the different types of activities that you can um, engage in under the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Programs. So in looking at developing specialized receiving or diversion centers. Uh, this is really for obviously a, a law enforcement focused program for individuals in custody of law enforcement really to assess for suicide risk and mental health or co-occurring mental health and substance use substance use treatment needs, as well as to really refer people or provide the appropriate evaluation or treatment services on site. Um, the next, looking at developing or enhancing computerized information systems. This is really key and we recognize that it's very difficult to have effective collaborations and be able to collect the kinds of data that you need in order to have functioning programs without the proper information systems. So in order to, to share that information between law enforcement and other criminal justice system personnel, we recognize these systems are critical. Also in improving the response to incidents involving people with mental disorders or co-occurring use disorders, again, these systems are critical in order to respond effectively. And also to be able to provide that kind of systematic analysis of incidents and to look at your data within your department, to look at how many and how these calls are being handled and responded to, it is critical to have these kinds of information systems in place so that you can uh, systematically analyze your own data. And looking at developing or expanding law enforcement mental health programs. So this is where a lot of folks think of, um, as I mentioned, crisis intervention teams, um, but also other opportunities such as co-responder programs. Um, so looking at the various different types of programs that law enforcement can form with their mental health providers um, in order to best respond to incidents involving people with mental disorders or co-occurring substance use disorders so that decisions can be made together between law enforcement and mental health professionals that meet both the public safety needs as well as the needs of the individuals with mental disorders. And also conducting a local evaluation. So I just want to draw everyone's attention to this piece um, because we knew we have a lot of anecdotal information from a lot of departments around the country about different types of programs that seemingly work really well. And that's wonderful. We're really happy to have that kind of anecdotal information, but what we're really lacking is an actual evaluation data which can show the effectiveness of these types of programs, such as crisis intervention teams. Um, so we really do encourage you to come in with a local research organization or a university, someone who can provide that type of um, research evaluation that can, can can really assist in looking at your programs and trying to evaluate um, their effectiveness. So um, at that point, I'm going to turn it back over to CSG, but I will be remaining on the call at the end for questions that might arise, and I will also be participating in the um, webinar. Um, that, that Cynthia mentioned that will be held next week and we'll be um, going through the solicitation in quite extensive detail and we'll be answering questions then as well. So I just want to thank you and turn it back over to CSG. Thank you, Danica. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Jerry Murphy. 
Thank you, Nikki, and uh, thank you, Danica, for your, your overview uh, of the, uh, the BJA program. Um, as Nikki said, uh, my name is Jerry Murphy. Uh, I am the law enforcement director here at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. And uh, Nikki and I and other staff, um, we oversee the uh, training and technical assistance that is provided to grantees. So um, those organizations that receive a JMHCP grant um, will work with us over uh, the course of their grant. Um, and our, our role is to, uh, to help the programs um, plan uh, their activities and then to implement them and to help them identify sort of common challenges that they might face um, and, of course, help them try to overcome those challenges. And our, our job ultimately is, is to help the grantees be as effective as possible and ultimately be, to be successful with their program. So we, we work with all current law enforcement grantees. Uh, we also work with uh, six law enforcement learning sites around the country. Um, and these are six police departments, and I'll run through them very quickly. Uh, Los Angeles Police Department, the Salt Lake City Police Department, Houston Police Department, Madison, Wisconsin Police Department, Portland, Maine Police Department, and the University of Florida Campus Police Department. And these are six law enforcement agencies um, that uh, serve um, uh, in uh, a peer-to-peer -peer capacity to help other law enforcement agencies that are looking to learn about specialized police response programs. So these six uh, sites, they will host visitors um, from other law enforcement agencies or they will, uh, in some cases, travel to your agency um, to spend a day or two with you to help you uh, put together a program. Um, and then uh, these sites also do uh, training. Um, and so they will uh, work in their particular states or they work in the region of the country to provide uh, recruit and specialized uh, level training to uh, police officers and others on how to respond to mental health calls for service. So what I'd like to do is give you just a quick overview about specialized police response programs. Uh, we refer to those as SPRs, uh, but specialized police response programs. I'll give you a quick overview of that, and then uh, my presentation will be followed by, by two examples of, um, of our current grantees that are implementing uh, the JMHCB grant uh, program in their agencies. But a specialized police <coughs> excuse me, response program um, is really where law enforcement agencies will partner with mental health or behavioral health agencies and community groups to design and implement the program to improve encounters involving people with mental disorders. And a couple of things I want to emphasize here is, number one, that um, these uh, pr approaches are collaborative. That is, it's not just a law enforcement agency working by itself or a mental health agency working by itself, but it's the law enforcement agency and the mental health agency working in collaboration uh, on a program that shares common goals. Uh, and so when you look at the program and you begin to think about preparing a proposal, um, it's extremely important that you have that collaborative element in your proposal, that you have both the law enforcement agency and the mental health agency um, signed on to be part of the grant. <clears throat> there are a variety of different facets that, that fall under sort of this just general heading of specialized police response programs. And just to reiterate some of the things that um, Danica Binkley mentioned, you know, this certainly includes street level responses to mental health calls for service, also includes uh, diversion uh, programs and diversion um, centers, uh, and it also includes an emphasis on uh, information systems. We know that uh, sharing information between criminal justice and behavioral health agencies is one of the greatest challenges uh, to building a collaborative specialized police response program. So uh, that is certainly uh, an area that many of our grantees uh, are looking to, uh, to enhance, to improve uh, the extent to which they can exchange information, um, obviously consistent with HIPAA at the federal and state level, but 
uh, there are certainly opportunities out there to improve information sharing to enhance the overall specialized police response program. These SPRs um, should ultimately produce better outcomes uh, for these encounters by training responders to use crisis de-escalation strategies and to prioritize treatment over incarceration when appropriate. So again, two things to emphasize here, this is sort of the short-term priorities, that is um, being able to better respond and manage uh, calls for service. Uh, so you have that immediate need, that tactical need, if you will, and there's sort of the long-term or strategic need, and that is to, um, to emphasize um, the right dispositions um, for individuals so that they get the treatment and care uh, that they need. Um, there are uh, really four goals for any specialized police response program, um, no matter what facet it's emphasizing. Uh, number one is to prevent the unnecessary incarceration and our hospitalization of mentally ill individuals. And it's very important to emphasize while still ensuring public safety. So there are, there will be some situations where, uh, quite frankly, the criminal justice system is the appropriate disposition. Uh, but there are many, many more uh, situations where uh, a behavioral health system, um, whether that be um, uh, a mental health uh, center or perhaps a substance abuse uh, center, um, is really the more appropriate disposition in many of these calls for service. So we're trying to match up um, the individual with the appropriate um, treatment and care that, the, that they require. Uh, the second goal is to provide alternate care in the least restrictive environment through a coordinated and comprehensive system-wide approach. So ideally in your community, uh, you would want to get as many uh, of the agencies in both the criminal justice and the behavioral health system involved in your specialized police response program. Um, and this certainly will begin with law enforcement agencies, whether you're a police or sheriff, but can certainly uh, extend um, to, uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, to jails, uh, to prosecutors, and to courts as well. Uh, there are many uh, jurisdictions around the country that run mental health uh, specialty courts, uh, and so the, to the extent that which you can involve as many of the actors in the criminal justice and behavioral health system as possible, uh, you uh, in, in, uh, ensure that you will have a comprehensive program that uh, can enhance uh, the goals that you're trying to achieve. Uh, the third goal is to prevent the duplication of mental health services, and really what we're trying to emphasize here is the importance of trying to reduce um, the cycling in and out of both the behavioral health and the criminal justice system. In many communities, there's a small number of individuals that, uh, that use more uh, resources than anyone else. Um, they might generate uh, an inordinate amount of uh, police calls for service on a monthly basis. Uh, they may be arrested um, uh, many times during a year, and, and so what we're trying to emphasize here is, try, is trying to identify those individuals um, and to keep them from cycling in and out of the systems. And then the fourth goal is to facilitate uh, the speedy return of police patrol units to patrol activities. Um, and, and this is certainly uh, you know, a strong priority in, in police agencies, um, but it's also important to realize that you know, not every police department will rely on um, an approach that requires uh, you know, patrol uh, units to get back in service right away. Uh, they might have a, a truly a specialized um, police response capability of officers that uh, do nothing but respond to mental health calls for service. And so we'll talk about those um, in just a minute and through some of the examples that we'll give. So there are really, um, at the street level, there are three um, you know, basic varieties of specialized police responses. One is crisis intervention teams. And this is uh, probably the most common uh, approach around the country, um, but it's still in the minority of uh, uh, when you look at all police departments in this country. You know, we know that we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 18,000 
law enforcement agencies in this country, and we estimate that um, about 12% of agencies, certainly no more than 15%, use a uh, CIT approach. So again, it's still a, a small number of agencies, but it is uh, probably the most common uh, type of uh, specialized police response. And this is a self-selected cadre of officers that are trained to identify signs of symptoms of mental illness, respond to calls, de-escalate the situation, and bring the person in crisis uh, to, uh, if it exists, in, in, in a around-the-clock uh, treatment center. Uh, those uh, centers don't always exist in every community, and so uh, that's where you need to work with um, the jails and the mental health centers in your community to determine uh, the most appropriate situations at, at different times of day or in, even in different parts of your city um, or jurisdiction. Um, a, a second model is a co-responder team, and this is where a specially trained officer uh, pairs with a mental health professional to respond to the scene of mental health emergencies. And this can be done on a full or part-time basis. Uh, that is, you know, it might only cover, um, uh, you know, four hours out of a given shift, um, or it might just be on one shift that might not be on 24 hours, uh, or it could be just in certain parts um, of your jurisdiction. And uh, that's why, you know, we emphasize early on uh, the importance of gathering information uh, and data uh, and being able to share it. So uh, the more data you can gather about the uh, mental health calls that you're responding to, the better able you will be as an agency to direct your resources to the time of day uh, and to the parts of your jurisdiction where you most likely to have mental health calls for service. And a third variety is what we call follow-up teams, and these are specially trained officers who work closely with mental health partners to identify individuals who repeatedly come to the attention of police. And the goal there is to develop long-term solutions. Often this is done through collaborative uh, case management uh, where, again, law enforcement um, officers and mental health clinicians uh, will meet on a regular basis um, to identify individuals that might be utilizing an uh, inordinate amount of resources uh, to put together plans um, to sort of jointly manage those individuals, to try to be proactive um, and to identify when problems might be arising and ultimately to reduce the calls for service. Um, and there are a variety of different approaches around the country to this. Uh, sometimes um, in some agencies um, this follow-up is done uh, on a voluntary basis uh, by a law enforcement officers. That is, they do this in addition to their, um, their normal duties. Uh, in other departments, this is done on an overtime basis, and uh, indeed, you know, the grants, uh, the JMHCP grants can support overtime to do this type of work. And in some of the largest uh, agencies around the country, um, this is done um, on a full-time basis. There are law enforcement officers who do nothing but this um, on a full-time basis. So that is just a quick overview of uh, what we mean when we say specialized police response. So, um, Nikki, I will turn it back to you now. Thank you, Jerry. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Eileen Flory. Hi, Nikki. Thank you. So, um, in a shared awareness of community deficits, the steering committee here in Bend, Oregon, applied for an opportunity to participate in um, a sequential intercept mapping workshop to identify gaps in services in our community. Using the outcome of that, we um, applied for the, um, the BJA grant in 2013 and were awarded that, which funds my position. Um, so we found some gaps in our services, and we've addressed that through the use of the, the funds that we received from your agency to increase training with our local police officers. We've completed three 40-hour trainings that have included um, additional um, trained officers 
in our local and regional area from, um, I'm sorry, I wrote that down. Um, through um, our Deschutes County and Crook County and Jefferson County here in our areas. We've also included that training to expand it to including um, EMS and dispatchers have also been included now in that training. So the primary goal is to improve our, um, the current training that we had here in our agency, in, in our area. We also have, started a data collection through um, our computer system that our police officers use to be able to help identify people that have had frequent contacts with our police officers. And it gives them some information on who contacts are in the community that can help them. So if they have a case manager, if they have a family member that's helpful, um, any kind of a pattern that maybe they have that's helpful, maybe they respond better to a female officer than a male officer, maybe they typically carry weapons and the police officers need to know that. And so this information is becoming available for them while they're on patrol and on their way to a call for officer safety and also for the safety of the community and that member. We're looking at diversion programs. So far, we're working with our mental health agency, Deschutes County Behavioral Health, and their MCAT unit, which is a mobile crisis assessment team. And we've been able to divert people from the hospital and or jail just by working closely with that team and having them come out to um, the call of the person in crisis and helping to form a safety net around them and help be able to keep them in the community if that is safe for them and being able to divert them from jails or our hospital. And the education piece we've also um, added for local agencies. I've gone out to our homeless shelters. I've gone out to some of our food banks and talked some about how best to interact with someone who's having a mental health crisis. We've discussed things like de-escalation skills, how to keep the staff safe, how to keep um, the person in crisis that's out in the community safe, and educated some of our community members about our CIT officers so that when the community calls in dispatch because of a concern they have for someone in the community, they're actually asking for a CIT officer. Next. So, we wanted to know why this is important. And when we applied for the grant and when we collaborated with our community members, we talked about why it's so important to do this and why um, we want to continue to do this. Um, comes back to officer safety and the safety of the, the community and the, and the person that's experiencing some type of mental health crisis. We're, by working closely together with our mental health and our hospital, we're better able to save resources. Um, it's a better use of what resources we have. Bend isn't a real large city, and so we really don't have the funding to be able to duplicate a lot of those services. So it helps reduce cost to the community. It's helping to decrease the number of arrests and the people that we're having to incarcerate at our local jail, because again, our jail is not um, very large due to our area. Um, we are promoting stakeholder collaboration and continue to work closely with Deschutes County Behavioral Health and the hospital as well as our other local law enforcement agencies. And this summer, we're, um, our chief is working with our Deschutes County Behavioral Health in order to form a collaborative team that will be responding to our calls in our community. And then also um, coming back around and following up with that person in the community the next day or within a couple of days to make sure that they have the resources that they need. Um, this is going to be very helpful, especially with our what we call our frequent flyers or our high utilizers of our, um, our resources here to be able to come back, circle back around and, and help offer them support when they're not in crisis and they're better able to maybe receive that help. So it also increases opportunities for diversion, um, helps reduce risk of potentially violent situations, but the more information that a police officer has when they're responding to the call and the history with that person, we feel that it's better um, able to reduce the potential risk of, of violence with that person, to be able to know who to contact, to be able to circle around those resources, to get a hold of a, a case manager or a family member that's best able to help de-escalate the situation in the community, 
for um, just for safety. And um, to help improve identification of mental illness and appropriate resources. So again, through the CIT training and the, the outreach that I do in the community to help um, our stakeholders and our community members to be able to even know what resources are available. One of the things I discovered after taking this job is there's so many more resources out there um, that other community members have their kind of their silo or their pocket that somebody else might be doing something much like it and they didn't even know about each other. And so helping to connect those services together and um, help them be able to work better together to offer the best services that we can. So the total number of CIT officers trained during our, since the um, grant was started, which um, I was hired December 30th of 2013. We have trained an additional 48 CIT um, officers as well as um, EMS. We opened it up our last training to um, EMS and they sent five of their officers. We have a college campus here and they have been sending security officers through the CIT program and getting them connected with the resources um, in the community and, and are working closely with our college campus security and the resources that our college has. Hospital security is sent through four and um, our interactions as a police um, agency with the hospital staff and with that security has increased um, greatly. The drop off time from when a police officer takes someone in on a police officer hold and then is able to leave the hospital to get back out on the road to do their job has greatly decreased because of the training that the security officers of the hospital have gotten. We've been training our local NAMI members and they've been coming in and sitting through the classes and also assisting with um, in our own voice and the family perspectives portion of the training which the officers have found very helpful. And then we have um, have hired a they mental health has hired a couple of new mobile crisis team workers who have also had the opportunity to go through the training and to be able to work with our law enforcement officers. So since the grant in the last uh, little over a year, 15 months since I've taken this position, we have um, trained an additional 68 people in our community. So I've I circled back around and have talked to some of our police officers about the training and if they've thought it was beneficial. And they have been ama amazing with their um, comments and the things that, and places that they've been able to use their CIT training. And the feedback that I've received is that they feel like it's really beneficial and that it's a different way of dealing with people than what they've been trained for in the past. And very positive feedback from our police officers. So thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Jenna Savage. Um, hi there, hope you can all hear me and thanks Mickey and Eileen and Jerry. Um, so here in Boston, uh, we do not do CIT for a few different reasons. One is just that it's kind of unfeasible at the moment given union restraints and that we're a pretty big department with almost uh, about 2,000 sworn officers. But we've also just from feedback um, found that we really do like having a co-responder model where we have officers co-respond with mental health clinicians who are embedded in a few of our uh, department stations. Um, and just to give a little background, we've received both the FY10 and the FY13 GMHCP grants. Um, we've, we used the FY10 grant to create an e-learning curriculum so that we could provide uh, mandatory training to all of our sworn officers explaining who, um, so who BEST is, and BEST is a Boston Emergency Services team. They work out of uh, Boston Medical Center and they're our local emergency services provider. So that's who's been our mental health partner uh, for years now. Um, but, you know, about 10, you know, starting in 2010, we really didn't have much of a relationship with them. So we used our FY10 grant to really ex expand that relationship um, so that our, all of our officers would know who BEST is, when to use them, how to use them, and what they can really be helpful to officers with. Um, so all of our officers now have done this training and are much more aware of BEST and use them on a regular basis, um, and they have access to a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week um, emergency call that they can call BEST. But then beginning in about 2000, uh, maybe 2011, 2012, we got a state-funded grant 
that enabled us to actually start a co-responder model. Um, so we were able to hire a full-time BEST clinician who still works for BEST, but is actually housed out of our, it started out in one of our district stations in B2, and it's since expanded to both B2 and B3, the neighboring district, um, and responds across both districts to mental health calls. So that clinician rides along with, you guys think you guys are quiet, sorry, Monica. Okay, sorry, my, my coworkers. Um, so that clinician uh, rides, rides around with officers in these districts, um, can go and you know, listen to the radio, they actually have their own call sign, and can respond to calls where they think an, emotion, an emotionally disturbed person's involved. So it doesn't even necessarily have to be a call that has a nature code for a mental health um, incident, but can just be a domestic violence dispute that might sound like it has a, a mental health um, component to it, and that clinician and the uh, Officer can co-respond to that, and the, the clinician helps with de-escalating and can provide on-scene um, assistance, can provide referrals, can take people to 24-hour um, um, crisis center, um, so helps to avoid emergency department visits and helps to avoid arrest. Um, and so that started out through a state-funded grant, and then in 2000, um, 13, we got a second grant from, J, uh, from BJA to expand that co-responder model to another area, which is Area E, um, and so that brings us to the current program goals that you see, was basically to expand our co-responder model to uh, basically three more districts in the city of Boston by hiring a whole other clinician who um, corresponds across these three districts, um, the goal being to provide you know, better response to emotionally disturbed persons in the community, to divert from arrest, to divert from emergency department visits, um, to you know, be, make better use of City of Boston resources, um, avoid unnecessary arrest and mental health um, visits in the ER, um, to also just generally improve our response still to EDPs. Um, and we also used this solicitation as an, um, an opportunity to work on uh, involving EMS more as well. Um, EMS happens to be like their call center is located here at BPD headquarters with ours. Um, and, you know, we obviously have to collaborate with them a lot, but as you can imagine, at the scene, you'll often get EMS, BPD, BEST, either all at the same time or one arriving after the other. So we're trying to kind of improve and just make that smoother transition, but also get EMS to use BEST more often as well, because they clearly get probably just as many, if not more, high utilizers and frequent suppliers than the BPD does. Um, so we haven't really done any, used any funding for that, but we used this grant as an opportunity to kind of force ourselves to work on that relationship. Uh, next slide, Nikki. Um, so for the components of our current grant, um, again, we, we hired a new full-time clinician who just started, I believe, last July, um, and that clinician is housed in three different districts. He actually rotates, I think he does maybe two days at each one, or maybe does it by week, I can't even remember, um, but he, he does have a desk space at one specific district where he can kind of have his home base. Um, but he's, you know, he's now riding along with, with officers in these three different districts and that they share um, a call, a radio sign, so he can respond across all three districts any given day. Um, so he can make on-the-spot assessments and help out, and they can also provide, um, you know, assistance at the stations and the holding cells and do evaluations there. Um, we've also, throughout the grant period, held several meetings with EMS to try and work on our um, relationship with them and with, with BEST, and we're, we're making headway. There's been some information sharing challenges, but we're definitely making some progress there. Um, and also along the way, we got a request to use BJA funds uh, for safety net or LOJAC. I'm not sure if people have heard of that, but essentially it really is LOJAC, but it's for people who have a tendency to wander. Um, so it's a way to kind of track where these people are, be it from Alzheimer's or autism. Um, but so we're able to use our BJA funds to also provide some of that service to people who cannot afford to, to get it themselves. So it's a very low cost, high impact um, service that we can do. Next slide. Nikki? Hello? Next slide, Nikki? I'll just keep going. Um, so we've, got, we've had some challenges. Um, one of them is just that obviously we've got one, uh, one clinician corresponding across three different districts, so it can take a long time to get to a call on time. Um, so that's been a challenge in and of itself. Um, but, but one of the other challenges is that, you know, this, these officers are volunteering to ride along with our clinicians, um, but they still do respond to other non-mental health calls. And so there'll be times when, you know, there, if a call for a burglary comes in and the car the clinician is in happens to be closest, then that car is going to respond and the clinician just has to wait. Um, so it's not always the best use of a clinician's time. It's time that could have been spent, you know, responding to another EDP call or time spent following up to existing cases. Um, so that's something we'd like to address, hopefully, in our upcoming proposal. Um, 
sustainability is always a challenge. Um, you know, we've been using grant funds so far to, to fund our, our co-responder models, but as everyone knows, grant funds do not last forever. Um, and we're in a time of, of serious budget cuts, so we're trying to find a way to really institutionalize our partnership with BEST and make sure it lasts over time. And with respect to data collection, I mean, we, we do collect data. Um, BEST is actually really good about collecting data, but it's not in a way that we, we don't really use it right now to, to really say anything meaningful about our accomplishments. We're not really using that data to sell ourselves or to really show what we've accomplished and how many diversions we've made. You know, we're not really um, just, we're not putting it out there very much. So we really do want to take advantage of the fact that we have this great program um, and really use more data and do a formal evaluation to really show what great work we've done. And then finally, as far as the accomplishments go, um, you know, we started out, I think I mentioned earlier, in Area B, um, and it, it took a very long time for our clinician to gain officer trust and to have people recognize him as a resource. Um, officers are often not really <laughs> um, fans of new people and strangers or having to babysit someone while being on call. So it took a very long time for that person to gain trust, and we were very fortunate that having already had, like, the, the Area B person really paved the way, um, our Area E person funded through BJA did take root much more quickly there, and we were able to really get him up and running much faster. Um, and we have seen much, uh, a lot of increased awareness and buy-in from BPD officers who will have, even though our co-responding clinicians are only in a few areas, we do get requests for them citywide, um, and they're often getting calls. Um, and just since July 1st, when our Area E clinician was hired, we've had 96 diversions from emergency departments. And based on a Department of Mental Health estimate that each ambulance ride costs about three to four thousand dollars. We're just estimating that that saved, you know, nearly four hundred thousand uh, dollars, and I'm sure that's probably an underestimate. And um, we've also had almost 150 diversions from arrest. Um, and I also want to mention that we also now, because of BJA, um, have better tracking for individuals who tend to wander but can't afford um, a tracking system themselves. And that is it for me. Thank you so much, Jenna and Eileen. Sure. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Jerry. Uh, well, uh, thanks, uh, Jenna, so much, and thanks, Eileen, for uh, giving us uh, a quick overview of your programs. Uh, I'm sure uh, everyone who's uh, who's listening, participating in the webinar, you know, will appreciate that uh, they have very um, you know complex programs that they are implementing, and so th this is just a, a very quick overview of some very impressive things that they're doing in their communities. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of bring us back to, uh, you know, the points that we're trying to emphasize here, uh, and really three things. One, you know, the JMHCP uh, grant program should bring together law enforcement and mental health systems for effective collaborative strategies. Uh, in both uh, Boston and in Bend, uh, the law enforcement agency uh, are working closely with their mental health partners. Um, working together in different ways um, and doing different things, but they still have that collaborative foundation uh, to their partnership. Uh, number two, uh, the JMHCP program should facilitate improvements in policies and procedures to increase diversion and reduce recidivism. So, you know, this begins uh, at, at the street level um, by uh, preparing your officers through training and awareness and education. Uh, and then continues sort of throughout the, the flow through either the criminal justice or the behavioral health system. Uh, but again, the strong emphasis on increasing diversion um, from either the criminal justice or behavioral health systems and reducing recidivism, that is reducing uh, the number of individuals who cycle in and out of either one of those systems. And then thirdly, a very strong emphasis on improving data collection and information sharing protocols. So uh, you were very excited uh, when we hear about law enforcement agencies that are uh, using the grant to improve their ability to collect data about mental health calls for service and to analyze that data. Uh, you know, the old saying, if you, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, and so when agencies are collecting data, they're in a much better position to manage the problem. And then, of course, both of our, um, our grantees that just uh, gave presentations are working on information sharing protocols, and that is the sharing of information between law enforcement uh, officers and mental health clinicians to improve that on-scene uh, response and then to achieve the larger goals of um, greater diversion and reduced recidivism. So that is um, uh, the presentation for today. Um, 
I thank everyone again who was here. And what we will do now is move into a question and answer session. I know uh, a number of questions have come through. And so I'll turn it over to um, Cynthia, who will uh, run through the questions. And uh, several of us might be answering them, depending on the particular question. Great. Thanks, everybody. And once again, we encourage you to type your question into the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, if the little words Q&A end up in red, you may have to click on the little arrow so that you can see that box so you can expand it so it looks like the little picture on your screen. Um, so there's going to be some, um, uh, some general questions I want to go over. Some housekeeping people keep asking basically the same questions about when this is going to be available. Um, and how they receive all the information. Um, anybody who has registered for this webinar will receive an email with a link to the audio portion and the PowerPoint slides that will be posted on our website within the next week. We're going to work to expedite that really, really quickly because we understand that jurisdictions need some time to write their applications as well as use some of the things that we've put in here as reference. Um, so you will get both the PowerPoint presentation um, in addition to um, the slides. On your screen right now, under additional resources, you see the very last link, link is csgjusticecenter.org slash mental health. You'll be able to find them at that um, location. Um, also, people had asked for a link to the next webinar, the general net webinar that's going to go over all of the um, specifics about the general solicitation, so the allowable uses, who can apply, um, more of those specifics. That webinar is happening next Thursday, March 12th at 2 p.m. In your chat window, I copied over a link for that registration just a little while ago. Um, you can also find it on our website under mental health and announcements, and it's called Call for Applications to the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. Um, if you're unable um, to access any of that information, you'll be able to contact one of the people that are presenting today, and we can send it to you directly. Um, okay, I think that is some of the um, general housekeeping questions, and we are getting a ton of questions in. Okay. Um, so I'm going to attempt to copy them into your chat window as I ask them. Um, a couple of other just quick things. Somebody had asked what the, the acronym for NAMI stands for, and that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, and somebody else had asked for what does VEST stand for, and that's the Boston Emergency Services Team. Um, and I believe that someone also had wanted to know the population of the county or city that's currently presenting, so I think that that was for Boston. So I don't know that you need the actual specific numbers, but it's a large metropolitan city. Yeah, yeah city, Boston, no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, city of Boston has about 600,000 people in it, um, and our, our clinicians are concentrated in certain areas, but they do respond citywide. Great. Okay, we're about to get into the nitty gritty. Um, if your question is not answered, please do go ahead and try and contact one of us, or we encourage you to please attend the event next Thursday. Any specific questions about law enforcement can be answered then as well. It's not solely um, just about the general solicitation, it's about the types of applications that people are wanting to submit. Okay, um, let's start with. Will multi-community applications be considered? For, ex for example, an application seeking funds to implement CITs over a five-county region with one county hosting and coordinating those trainings. Um, I believe yes. Um, we have a number of different state-level jurisdictions as well as different counties that partner with um, adjacent counties, other counties where they have collaborated and worked together to basically um, come together as a multi-criminal justice agency with multi-mental health agencies to roll out these initiatives, so that is very common. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, that, that is uh, you know, an approach that, that we try to emphasize uh, to law enforcement agencies that is of tremendous value. Um, for instance, uh, we know that uh, with the, the Houston Police Department, which is one of our learning sites, um, they work closely with uh, the Harris County um, Sheriff's Department, and so they have developed um, sort of collaborative uh, uh, response models. Uh, and so that um, what is happening in the Houston Police Department is also happening in the Harris County uh, Sheriff's uh, Office 
And so they have a common approach to responding to mental health emergencies. And then oftentimes, um, for instance, if you were to look at within a particular county, um, a particular county might have a number of, you know, towns or small cities, and each of those cities might have its own police department, but the mental health services are organized on a county level. So that is, again, another situation where it makes uh, a lot of sense for, uh, for instance, all of the police departments or um, in a particular county to have a similar type of, of response protocol um, and so that it allows for better collaboration across the mental health services. Great. Um, will this grant cover the expenses of having a mental health professional on staff? or does an agency need to budget for that position? Uh, yes, so the grant um, does provide uh, funding for salaries for uh, specialists who will be working in this area. Um, and, and that's really sort of a, a two-part question, does, does my agency need to budget for this position? And the answer to that is yes, too. So, um, and so you're, you're really kind of asking two different questions. Um, you know, local law enforcement agents, agencies are going to have to put all personnel in their budgets, um, but the grant dollars will pay for a particular position that is going to be focused on the work of this grant. So yes to, to both, both questions. Great. Um, hold on one second. My screen's scrolling very quickly. <laughs> Um, since you said we were only going over categories two and three today, does that mean that no category one applications will be considered under this solicitation? So absolutely not. What we meant by we were only going over categories two and three today is essentially the types of initiatives um, that were presented today and the types of initiatives that you would apply for would be either a planning and implementation grant category two or an expansion grant category three. Category one is specifically um, focusing on the prevalence of individuals within jails, so that will be jurisdictions or um, corrections institutions that are applying to expand treatment services within their jail or within their county and is that you know, doing that kind of focus. It's quite possible that it could be law enforcement partnering with a jail in some capacity, but generally speaking, it's gonna be under a P&I or an expansion grant. Um, category one is actually new to the solicitation this year. We will review that on next week's um, solicitation and we'll talk about that further next week. But yes, we are accepting category one applications this year as well. Okay. Um, can a law enforcement agency apply with a community-based behavioral health organization, or does the law enforcement agency need to apply with the state behavioral health organization as a partner? So, yes and yes. <laughs> um, the requirement of JMHCP is that there is both a criminal justice partner and a behavioral health entity. That could be either a local, city, county, or state level. Um, someone wanted to know what the University Police Department mentioned in Florida was earlier in the presentation? Yes, the University of Florida Campus Police Department. They're one of our six learning sites. If you were to, um, to go to um, our web page, um, the law enforcement web page on the CSG Justice Center website, uh, you can get more information about the six learning sites. Um, and another question, um, can a city police department apply or does this solicitation require county or statewide applications? Absolutely, a city can apply. Um, it needs to be some kind of criminal justice agency and we get, we run the gamut, city, um, state, county, and so on and so forth. We also have sheriff's departments apply as well. That's right, yes. Yeah. So uh, city police departments, county police departments, uh, town, ship police departments, um, and sheriff's offices as well. Um, we're really uh, encouraging state police agencies to apply as well. Um, we've worked with uh, only one or two of those. We tend to work more with city and county, uh, but uh, very excited to uh, hopefully get a state um, level application as well as tribal uh, applications. Yep. 
Um, and just to clarify one more time, yes, a law enforcement agency and a mental health organization are required to apply together. So you need to have some criminal justice entity and some mental health entity. That mental health entity, by the way, can be both a county, city, state level mental health authority that oversees a lot of the mental health processes or practices within the community, or it can be an individual mental health organization or community-based center. Um, this is one of my favorite questions, um, totally off topic. Is the solicitation appropriate for implementing a juvenile mental health court? Absolutely yes. Um, I say that because I oversee all the juvenile grantees. Um, what were the six agencies available to assist train in the CIT response model? Um, I believe they're referring to, law, to the learning sites, so if you could yes. just rattle those off one more time. Sure, the six uh, law enforcement learning sites are, again, the Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD, it's the City Police Department, the Salt Lake City Police Department, uh, Madison, Wisconsin Police Department, uh, Houston, Texas Police Department, Portland, Maine, and the University of Florida Campus Police Department. Okay, give me one second, just clarifying some questions. The focus in the webinar is on initiatives in the community. Would a proposal to develop and evaluate a CIT program within a corrections environment, i.e. prisons, be something that would be considered for funding? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we work with a, a couple of grantees that are, are doing just that. They're doing CIT um, either in a state prison or in a local jail, so that those are allowable uses. Great. Um, and if otherwise not addressed, what types of things can be funded for expanding programs, new sworn personnel, mental health crisis specialists? Yes, to both of those. Uh, you know, we would emphasize that um, you know, every agency that has a grant and wants to um, move to apply to an expansion grant, sort of go through the process again that, that, that hopefully you did it the first time you applied, and that is to do sort of an assessment of your needs um, in your area. Uh, where you have resources, and then begin to um, you know, identify the gaps um, in your services or your resources. Uh, and so if, uh, if additional officers um, will help uh, fill the gaps that you have uh, and you don't have the resources to do that, then yes, officers are, are certainly appropriate. I don't want to make a blanket statement and say, you know, just apply for officers. The point I just want to emphasize again is it's very important for each jurisdiction to do an assessment of their needs and resources and then to put together uh, an application that is consistent with uh, your local jurisdiction's goals in this particular area. We really emphasize that each jurisdiction should develop and implement a program that fits its particular needs. We do not um, uh, promote sort of one size fits all, or if, uh, you know, if the neighboring city is doing it, then, then you should do it in your police department. Everyone needs to assess their community's resources and needs and then develop a program to respond to the gaps in needs. Excellent. Um, I believe this is a question for next week. Um, could you talk about allowable expenses under the grant in general? I believe that's a question that's really we can go over next week. Um, there's a lot of allowable uses under each of the different categories, so we'll review those next week on the general webinar. If there's something specific that you guys have a question about, you'll be able to contact us directly. And, and don't forget to, um, to look at the actual solicitation, um, which is available uh, on, on the BJA web. Um, if you look at the uh, solicitation, um, there is uh, sections that talk about allowable uses um, for the various um, uh, categories of grant programs. So uh, look there, um, and if that doesn't uh, answer your, uh, your questions, then we will certainly try to address them next week. Um, on page six of the solicitation, there are specific allowable uses for law enforcement, and then it goes all the way through to page 11 as well. Um, to direct you specifically. Um, this is a question I can't answer. Are these grants available to law enforcement agencies? And it's actually, Danica, I think you're still on the line that we might need some help with. 
Okay. Are these grants available to law enforcement agencies only, or can an organization like NAMI apply for the grant to use for law enforcement education? I no, um, if you look at the um, um, application eligibility on the front page of the solicitation, it will state that the applicant must be um, a unit of government, whether that be state or local. Um, and so uh, NAMI could not be the applicant, but that's not to say that you couldn't partner um, with NAMI, it's just that the um, the applicant would either either need to be, you know, city, state, local, county, um, tribal, um, some form of, of local entity or state or local entity, um, and that could even be the behavioral health. If you have a county or city um, behavioral health provider um, that serves that function, um, then they could also be an applicant, but it just must be um, a, a state or local or tribal agency to meet that criteria. Great, thank you. Um, this is a more general question, um, and I think this is kind of fun to answer, but um, sounds like our first step is to meet with our mental health professionals in our area and collaborate and come up with a plan. And we are all nodding our heads, thumbs up at you, and smiling. Um, that's basically the point of these grants. Um, that's why the word collaboration is in the name. That's exactly what we hope to do um, and encourage you to do. And that's basically get around a table and do some brainstorming and then respond to the solicitation. Um, you don't have to have all of the, the kernels of what you want to do exactly fleshed out. That is what the planning period is for and that's why the grant is three years. You can spend time together figuring out what that actually looks like on the ground, but you're generally looking for a general scope of a project that you would like to outline in your solicitation. Um, I think this is for next week also, but we can uh, just generally respond to if overhead costs are allowable as well as personnel and materials expenses. Um, personnel, yes. Materials, um, yes. I believe the solicitation might outline what some of those pieces are. Um, as well, you can ask that question for more specifics. We'll have um, the finance staff that's um, going to be able to go into that more extensively next week um, during the Thursday webinar. Um, okay, uh, it looks like these questions were answered. Okay. Um, will next week's webinar cover any information how to prepare the grant application? Um, so, yes. Uh, loosely, there are a lot of instructions in the later half of the solicitation that tells you what you need to talk about within each application section. Um, I will find what pages it's on as we're talking. It starts on page 17, application and submission information, what an application should include. And it goes through numbers like one through seven of each individual section that you need to actually write within the solicitation. So your abstract, um, a narrative, and then what's in the narrative specifically. I encourage you to please take a look at that section first and then to attend the webinar next week. If there is something that you are unclear about, actually, I'm sorry, it's actually on page 28, application review information. Um, it actually shows you the allocation of each section. So the statement of the problem is 20%, project design and implementation is 40%, and it gives you examples of what to include in there with specific bullet points. I strongly encourage you to review those sections and then attend next week's webinar in case something is unclear about that and you have more specific questions. You might also have specific questions that pertain to the initiative, even law enforcement after you review those. Those are perfectly fine questions to ask next week. And one other thing related to that, Cynthia, is um, especially perhaps for some smaller uh, law enforcement agency, you might not necessarily have um, someone in-house uh, who uh, has prepared uh, proposals for grants like this before. So uh, if, if that is the situation, I, I would em emphasize that you try to work with your larger uh, unit of government, you know, whether that be the, the city government or the county government, uh, because oftentimes there are individuals in city and county government, uh, oftentimes in the finance department, that do write uh, proposals um, for funding. So if, if you, you yourself do not have experience writing proposals 
I'm almost certain that you'll find someone in your city or county government or state government that does have experience writing proposals and you might want to pull them into this uh, proposal development process. On the screen right now, there are two links to help you with that. Information on JMHCP on the BJA page. You will find a couple of examples of proposals throughout the years. Um, from a variety of different years, so previous applications that you can take a look at and actually download and use as a guide when you're writing your proposal. These were applications that were um, successfully awarded, um, as well as BJA's grant writing manual, um, which is a PDF you can print off and walks you through um, how to write these different solicitations. Um, Danica, this is a question for you. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'll allow you, this, you to field this one. Are you dedicating a certain percentage of funding to law enforcement priority? Um, we're not. Um, we are waiting to see what comes in. So there's, an, as you'll see in the solicitation, there's a number of priority considerations. So there's a whole process that we go through when we um, receive the applications that go through peer review and then, um, you know, receive the results of the peer review scores. Um, and assessments, and then we um, assess the priority considerations and, and go from there. So we're not quite sure yet what, how this will all exactly um, fall out, but we certainly, um, like I said, have made this a priority and plan to, you know, hopefully um, award accordingly. So without more information, I'm sorry, I can't get more specific. Great. Um, it appears that this grant is focused on diversion on the front end at the street officer level. What about the time of release for the mental health inmate being released? Reference reentry and case management with mental health resources is this a consideration? Absolutely. Um, we wanted to do a carve out today specifically for law enforcement questions to answer the types of questions about different specialized police responses, things that fall underneath the law enforcement category because it is a priority consideration in the application. However, um, there are approximately and over 250 applicants to JMHCP each year, and a vast majority of those have to do with the types of different programs I had talked about specifically at the beginning of the webinar. That can be anything from, yes, earlier intercept points like mental health courts, pretrial diversion, alternative sentencing, but a good majority of programs also do typical reentry services, that is, people that are working with discharge planners in a corrections institution and partnering with probation to make sure the mental health services are layered on. It could be a community-based mental health provider that is working with probation or some other kind of community corrections agency looking to, um, to make sure that there is a, um, a full cadre of services for somebody who has mental health or co-occurring disorders. And yes, absolutely, that is a majority huge focus of JMHCP. Okay, so this question, um, we've done this again, but it seems like there's still a question about this, so let's just go through this one more time. Does a law enforcement agency need to be the applicant to meet this priority? For example, could a county mental health department be the applicant and work with one or more law enforcement departments? Yes. Absolutely. And again, if you look on the, the first page of the solicitation, um, the, the applicant has to be an entity of state, local, city or county government. So it could be either law enforcement agency or mental health agency. Terrific. Um, hold on one second. Uh, this is for you guys. My agency is a post, post officer standards and training. Does my agency qualify as law enforcement? Um, that is a Good question. Um, certainly, um, posts are entities of, of local government, um, and so I would assume that you're, you're talking about perhaps uh, developing or implementing um, training on a, um, on a statewide basis. Um, so, I, yeah, my, my answer is going to be yes, but uh, Danica, could, could you weigh in on that? Can you repeat what the question was again? I'm sorry. My agency is a post, police officer standards and training, and do they qualify as law enforcement? Someone just actually chatted with us and said she was thinking that they were considered a state agency only and that they don't uh, have law enforcement working there possibly. I'm not sure about that. We'd have to follow up. I, I hate to give a definitive question, uh, answer right now without more information. I think that's yeah, one we need to follow up on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Um, and we can, well, we can follow up with that. We're going to be sending out information in terms of the slides and a link to the webinar registration next week. We can follow up in the email about that as well. Um, there's a number of questions, number of um, folks that are asking this question. They would like to know whether or not the funds can be used for overtime. Um, and there's a second piece of that, or does the mental health provider need to be funded as well? So basically overtime for officer use. Yes. Okay. Um, and I think that as far as the second half of that question, or does mental health partner need to be funded as well? Um, I think there's a lot of jurisdictions or programs where all of the funding goes just towards the criminal justice or in this respect, law enforcement agency. Um, but usually there's gonna be, because there's a partnership or collaboration, somebody from mental health is on staff doing something and usually needs some kind of compensation because we're, we're talking about layering on mental health services in some fashion. So I think it might be, it would be strange or maybe not fully um, cover the requirements to not have anything covering mental health services. Am I articulating yes, that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, good question. Could grant funds be used to create temporary shelters for mentally ill if nothing exists in the community? Danica, this is sort of an allowable use Thing. Um, we've actually had something similar to that in terms of current grantees wanting to change their funding. I'm not sure if this means paying for housing, helping supplement a shelter. I think that's, that's I could use some help there. Yeah, and I think that it sort of depends on, on you know, because we do, um, you know, advocate funding receiving centers, so which is, you know, a certain variety of, of um, it's not necessarily a shelter, but at least where um, mentally ill people can be taken in order to receive services. And while shelter is very different, um, certainly there can be some overlap there. So it sort of just depends on the law enforcement involvement because this is a collaboration. It's not just about um, funding services, which is important, and we recognize that there are needs um, that are a part of this collaboration that need to be addressed, and that can certainly go towards that. But I think that that would need to be viewed in a larger context of how that fits into the collaboration um, with, you know, it doesn't have to be law enforcement. I said law enforcement because that's what we're talking about today, but with the criminal justice partner um, and um, behavioral health. So it, it just, it, it totally depends. I hate to give a definitive yes or no, depending on the larger context. I, I wouldn't necessarily rule it out, but I think there's a lot more information that we'd need to know. Okay. Um, and just, okay. I would just add that we do have a lot of flexibility, and that's why I don't mean to seem wishy-washy, but, but truly we do have, you know, we, we tried to give a whole range of um, types of uses of these funds for this program because there is so much flexibility to meet the needs of the community. So depending on, you know, is it, the most critical factor is that we do have that collaboration in place. Um, as the name states, it's justice and mental health. So, you know, depending Depending on, on what that collaboration um, produces, you know, that can be a whole host of variety of programs or services um, that, that can come out of that collaboration, but, but that critical piece needs to be in place first. Okay. Um, we have begun our CIT training and are in the infancy phase. Would we be able to include further training efforts in concert with collaborating with our state's Department of Mental Health? Yes. Beautiful. Um, and then we are looking to collaborate to research and review county, ah, my screen scrolling, hold on. We're looking to collaborate to research and review county programs currently in place statewide. There is not state oversight or knowledge of what is out there. Can we use this funding in addition for this use in collaborating with the State, of, state Department of Mental Health? Can you read that again? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. We are looking to collaborate to research and review county programs currently in place statewide. So I think sort of like a needs assessment, not a need, uh, an evaluation, an evaluation of state of counties. Um, uh, hold on, my screen keeps scrolling. <laughs> so if I, if I understand understand the question, that there there might not be the services, um, mental health services at at the county level, 
but they could be available um, through a state agency at that level. And it, so. it looks like they're, they would like to evaluate at the state level what's going on at the county level, so like a, a statewide assessment of the services that are out there, if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, can they use the funding in addition to that? Can they use the funding for that, I think? Well, I think it would be more than just an assessment of, of available services. It's right? just standardizing things throughout county. Okay. So, yes, yes. that would, yes. yes. Yep. Um, we actually have, in fact, if you wanted to talk about our state-level grantees, the state-level grantees that we have had under JMHCP frequently are to implement practices, manuals, um, skill sets within multiple counties and within multiple providers for standardizing some kind of a system, some kind of a practice. Not necessarily with law enforcement, sometimes within community-based providers, and or even um, looking at what different counties do. For example, we have a juvenile justice grantee in the state of New Mexico right now. It is a state-level Department of Mental Health grantee that is doing a um, treatment protocol that they are rolling out county by county. They have operationalized and defined what case management looks like at the state level, and they're rolling that out to multiple counties all at once. They've created an online training system for the counties and the, and the providers, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. Um, uh, can a county behavioral health authority be the lead applicant? Absolutely. Um, Mental health services provider as a partner, is it a government agency or the vendors they contract with? That's a good question. So I think that means um, if you're like a, 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 Danica, this might be a question for you. Yeah. If it's the, yeah. They have to be designated as the county provider. So sometimes right. that is a, pri a private provider, but they are designated as the county behavioral health provider or mental health provider. So they have to have that designation if they're going to be the applicant. So it's not to say that they couldn't come in as the partner, but in order to be the applicant, you must have that designation. Okay. Um, Similar kind of question, can the criminal justice applicant subcontract out to a local behavioral health organization for a clinician, or does the CJ entity need to employ a clinician directly? Either Danica, or. For you. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can contract that out. You can employ. Um, certainly, that's just dependent on the type of model. Um, but, you know, we, we certainly have seen grantees who've done both. Um, can the mental health provider be a hospital partner? Uh, yes. If they're providing and mental health, health services, services yeah. I would think, yes. Yeah. Um, there was a question, a general question, if this is an annual grant to apply for, sometimes. <laughs> um, in a couple of years, as in last year in 2014, and then in 2012, those were non-competitive years because in the previous years, 2011 and 13, there was an overwhelmingly high scored number of applications that BJA did not open up the solicitation for competition in 12 and in, no, in 12 and in 14. They chose the grantees from the previous year. So I can't tell you if that's going to happen again. Um, Danica, I don't know if you want to feel that yep. if what I just said is enough. Yeah, no, but that's that's great, um, and we just don't know. So it, it it totally depends on how many applications we receive, how many we're able to fund, um, and how many are sort of in that top scoring category that, that are left unfunded when we come um, to this point next year. Um, so it, it's we we do anticipate having the program next year. Um, it's just a question of whether or not we reissue the solicitation, if that helps. Okay. Um, does NAMI qualify as a mental health organization for the purposes of this grant? No. no. Nope. Yep. There's been a bunch of questions about explaining the match requirements. We can review those next Thursday. That's ge that's a general solicitation question. Um, what about a private nonprofit mental health, I'm thinking agency that's contracted with the state and county, um, if they're able to be an applicant? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we have just a we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, 
give me one second, I'm just scrolling through. Okay. Um, I believe that the last page of the, of the presentation was left off with all of our contact information, meaning the contact information for folks from um, BJA and from CSG. When we send out the link to the PowerPoint slides and to the audio portion of the event, we will include everybody's email addresses in case there are further questions that you would like us to answer. Um, we'll also be sending out a link to the registration for the webinar next week. Um, just seeing if there are a couple more questions we can answer quickly. I think that everything else that's been asked, so if your question has not gotten addressed yet, it has to do with the type of agency that you are um, and whether or not you can apply under these funds. So if you are a county agency, a community behavioral health provider, we've gotten a slew of those questions in a row that's more applicable for the webinar that we're going to be discussing next week, and we will go over those. We'll make a point of making sure um, that those things are addressed. Um, so we'll get to those next week. Um, if you have specific questions, which there are a couple of specific questions about some of the content of the slides and some of the things we just mentioned in the Q&A, you can contact Jerry directly. He has an easy name and email address, so I'm going to give that to everybody very quickly. It's G, like Gary, Jerry, Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y, at csg.org. Um, Sheila, I know that you're typing. If you can put that in the chat window um, to all panelists, that would be great. Again, it's G Murphy at csg.org. Um, I think that concludes our Q&A portion. Um, you can always send out additional questions to Jerry. And again, we encourage you to please join the webinar next Thursday to get any other additional questions that you have that were not specific to the law enforcement initiatives um, addressed then. And if there's something from a law enforcement perspective or over the course of the week after you've gotten familiar with the solicitation, some of the allowable uses and how to apply, we do encourage you, if you are a law enforcement agency, to please attend next week as well. It is not limited to just the general solicitation. This concludes our webinar to assist law enforcement agency applications for the Bureau of Justice Assistance FY 2015 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. Thank you to all, thank you all for your attendance and participation. Thank you to the Bureau of Justice Assistance for sponsoring this event. And a big thank you to our presenters, Cynthia, Danica, Jerry, Jenna, and Eileen. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.